Good evening. Uh, welcome to the General Society Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. And tonight, in fact, is our final lecture in the series. And I want to say we, how we appreciate you coming out on such a, a wet night. So a, ver a very warm welcome and thank you for making it between the showers. So thank you so much. The Labour, Literature and Landmark Lectures are supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. I'd also like to express our gratitude to Thomas Donahue, who has created a special window display for tonight's talk. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York was founded 233 years ago. Today, our organization continues to improve and serve the people of the City of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include our uh, John M. Mossman Lock Collection, which you can see upstairs, and you're more than welcome uh, to have a look at that after this program. The library, of course, which you're in. Um, our tuition-free Mechanics Institute. And finally, our lecture series. Our lecture series is nearly 200 years old. Tonight, in a talk based on his book, Behemoth, A History of the Factory and the Making of the Modern World, historian Joshua, Joshua B. Freeman will provide an overview of the global history of the rise of the factory and its effects on society. And I also want to mention that this acclaimed book will be on sale, and I'm, uh, I'm sure uh, Josh will be more than happy to sign copies of the book for you. The New York Times described this book as rich and ambitious, more than an economic history or a chronicle of architectural feats and labor movements. Beaminus depicts a world in retreat that still looms large in the national imagination. Joshua B. Freeman, is a distinguished professor of history at Queens College and the Graduate Center of CUNY. His previous books include American Empire and Working Class New York. He lives in New York City. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Joshua Freeman. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, for coming out in, in a very threatening and hot and muggy day. And I would really like to thank the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen to, for inviting me to speak. You know, given the history of the General Society, you know, founded over 200 years ago by skilled craftsmen, this was actually a very kind of generous invitation because the subject I'm gonna be talking about today, the big factory, uh, was in many ways a threat to the skilled craftsmen and uh, their way of life. Um, uh, yet stepping back, I think both the skilled craftspeople of 200 years ago and the factories I'm going to talk about tonight uh, were both part of a world that's you know, too often ignored, the world of making things, the world of manufacturing. And it was in part to bring this world back to public attention uh, that I wrote Behemoth, the book I'm going to be talking about tonight. Um, and so I'm very happy that uh, you folks have uh, chosen to share a few minutes uh, hearing about it. Um, I'm a labor historian. I've thought about factories on and off for many years, but it was really only in 2010 that I started thinking about this in a more systematic way, to think about the giant factory as a distinct social institution with a kind of transnational history. And the thing that began me thinking about this were events in China. Uh, as some of you may recall, in 2010, there was a rash of suicides uh, at, that brought global attention to a Taiwanese company that at the time almost nobody had ever heard of in the United States called Foxconn. Uh, 18 workers between the ages of 17 and 25 attempted suicide at Foxconn factories, 14 successfully, mostly by jumping off the roofs of these buildings. And you know, of course, this is very startling in and of itself, 
But I think what really brought this story for a moment to international attention was that the suicides occurred at factories that were making iPads and iPhones, which were, uh, you know, the hottest uh, goods on the market and that, that were sort of symbols of, of modernity and good living. And this juxtaposition of these workers so unhappy or alienated or whatever that they took their own lives with the products they were making, uh, you know, luxurious, uh, seamless, futuristic, uh, raised uncomfortable questions, you know, about the human cost of the stylish gadgets that we all use and more largely of the kind of modernity that those electronic things have come to represent. Um, you know, Foxconn factories are staggeringly large. The company's Langhua Science and Technology Park, which is in Shenzhen, China, and is uh, commonly known as Foxconn City, uh, in 2010, as far as I can tell, was the largest workplace in terms of the number of workers in human history. There were over 300,000 workers working in that Foxconn factory complex at the time of the suicides. And this is not unique. There's actually a newer Foxconn plant in central China about the same size. Pegatron, which is one of the competitors of Foxconn, uh, also assembles electronic goods, uh, has about 100,000 people in its Shanghai plant. Uh, there were also sneaker and footwear factories in Asia, which are on this scale. Uh, there's a a factory in uh, Dangguan, China, that in the mid 2000s had 110,000 workers making sneakers. Um, you know, so these factories are massive, they're unprecedented in their size, and yet they are very little known outside of the places they were located. You know. and, and this really struck me because you know, we live in a factory made world, at least most of us do. You know. Uh, factories produce the clothes we wear, they produce the food we eat, the medicines we take, uh, the cars we drive, the furniture we use, the electronic devices that are pervasive in our lives. Uh, they produce the caskets that we are buried in. Um, contrary to decades of talk about uh, post-industrial society, we are living actually in a heyday of manufacturing. If you just look at the United States, of course, the percentage of the workforce that's employed in manufacturing has declined quite sharply over the last few decades. But if you open up and look globally, we are near an all-time high. In 2010, 29% of the global workforce was employed in industry, okay? So, you know, most of us would be uh, hard put to survive, even for a very brief period of time, uh, without factory-made goods, and yet we pay very little attention to the places where these goods are made. You know, there's a, a whole debate, of course, in the United States about factory jobs, and we could talk about that later, but that debate very rarely actually looks at current, real, existing factories and the lives of the workers inside them. Um, Things were not always this way. Factories, especially the largest, the most technically advanced factories, were once objects of great wonder. You know, uh, journalists, novelists, social scientists, political radicalists, industrial engineers, uh, parliamentarians, they all uh, grappled to try to understand, you know, what were the meaning and consequences of this central social institution. Uh, painters, photographers, filmmakers celebrated the factory. Um, you know, and I think from the start, observers recognized the revolutionary nature of the factory. You know, factories ushered in a new world. The, their, their novel machinery, their workforces of unprecedented size, the uh, outflow of uniform products in large numbers commanded great attention, you know, and so did the physical and social and cultural arrangements that I'll talk about that were necessary for these factories to, to, uh, to develop and, and, and to function. So the factory, it seems to me, represented a kind of break from the past, a radical break from the past, uh, in both material life and in the way we thought about the world. Uh, the large factory became a kind of embodiment of uh, dreams about the future and also 
nightmares about the future. Um, so in response to these Foxconn suicides, uh, which really uh, took me aback, uh, I set out to trace a, a kind of history of the factory and its role in the making of the modern world. And I did this through a series of case studies of landmark factories starting in 18th century England and going up to modern Asia. And I, you know, I sort of tried to understand, first of all, why do we have these factories at all? What determined their scale? And to chart the kinds of innovations, technical, architectural, social, that made them possible. Um, and alongside looking at the factories themselves, I also got increasingly interested in how these factories were understood and represented in their time. You know, how did they appear in literature, in art, in the political debate that accompanied the Industrial Revolution? And I, I, I came to believe, and I think, I, I hope I was right, that by looking across time and space, you know, I could identify recurring patterns, but also see the ways in which current large factories actually differ from those in the past. So this is a long, complicated story. If you want the whole thing, I, I, I should be a salesman and say, you could buy a copy at the end of the talk in the back of the room. I obviously can't do all of this tonight, but what I want to do is to at least talk about some of the patterns that emerge as you follow the factory wandering around through time and space, and then, uh, sort of then point to some, some observations about uh, the role of the factory in the past and maybe even uh, going into the future. Well, many scholars point to a silk mill erected in Derby, England in 1721 as the first uh, successful example of a factory as we use the term today. And hopefully there's a picture of that silk mill. This, was built in 1721. This lithograph actually comes from 1835, considerably later. Um, this mill was designed to produce silk yarn, and it seemed to bring uh, the factory onto the historical stage in, in, in fully developed form with all the characteristics of a modern factory. It had a large workforce, uh, which was engaged in coordinated production of a standardized good using machinery powered by a central motive force. In this case, it was a 23-foot water wheel, which is actually under the building, so you don't see it in that image. Um, and you know, the thing that's amazing to me, this is 300 years old, you look at it and you go, oh, it's a factory. You know, it's, uh, the templates seem to just burst into existence from, from the very start. Uh, with 300 workers, mostly children, this mill, uh, represented a radical uh, jump in the scale of manufacturing, which previously had largely been done either by very small groups of craftsmen or even more commonly in the home as a kind of domestic activity. Well, as an economic model, the factory actually spread rather slowly. But what's interesting is that almost immediately before many others of these things came along, people recognized the importance of this new model. Um, the scale of operations, the ingenuity of the machinery uh, brought a stream of admiring uh, tourists, I guess you have to call them, uh, who wanted to look at it. One of the early visitors was Daniel Defoe, who you know, we associate with Robinson Crusoe, but you know, he, he trekked over to take a look at this new thing under the sun. 50 years later, James Boswell comes to, to visit it. Um, and you know, in, in celebrating this new factory, they actually helped transform the meaning of what we say when we say modern. You know, what do we mean when we say something's modern? Till around the time that this factory opened, you know, most people believed that the modern world was inferior to the past. You know, they looked back to the classical world as a sort of superior world. Uh, but in the 19th century, you know, late 18th century, uh, in the age of the factory, modern increasingly came to connote improved, you know, uh, desirable, the best that can be as part of a general embrace of a kind of ideology of progress of which the factory was a central uh, component. The cotton mill uh, soon succeeded and overshadowed the silk mill and tightened this connection between the factory and the idea of modernity. By the 1790s, there were cotton mills in England 
that had 1,000 workers. And by the 1830s, there was one that had 2,000 workers. Now, any of you, I know there are some people in this audience, I'm sure they're involved in modern in, you know, industrial production. And even today, in the United States, a 2,000-person factory is a large factory. Uh, factories that large created uh, required the creation, the invention of a kind of infrastructure of modern life. Uh, first of all, to house their machinery, uh, you needed architectural innovations, uh, including the use of iron to frame buildings to be strong enough to support equipment in multi-story buildings. Uh, the first elevators appeared in cotton mills to move supplies and people uh, between floors. Uh, but the cultural changes were even more important. Um, there was a, a, a contemporary journalist, a guy named Andrew Ure, who was the great sort of celebrator of the factory. And, and, and you know, he said, the greatest hurdle that the mill owners faced was, quote, training human beings to renounce their desultory habits of work and to identify themselves with the unvarying regularity of the complex automation, okay? Uh, you know, factory operation actually required a whole new time sense, you know, uh, because you had to get all these workers involved in coordinated production arriving every day at the same time, working for the same hours, leaving at the same time. You know, and this is a radical break from the agricultural and the artisanal rhythms that had been set by the seasons, by when it was light, and by the tasks at, at hand. So it's a, a kind of fundamental, I don't know what you call it, like psychocultural you know, break point in human history. Now we run by you know, bells and clocks and all that. We take it for granted. But that was not the case when the factory came into being. Um, so people sometimes talked about the factory system. It was not just the buildings, but it was a whole uh, complex of a workforce, the conditions they lived in, the uh, 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 arrangements that surrounded it. And I think what was interesting is that the factory itself and the machinery often were greatly praised, but there was a lot more ambivalence about the factory system. And you know, foremost in the criticism uh, was the widespread use of child and female labor, the exploitation. Uh, children, in some cases, very young. When I say very young, I mean five, six, seven, uh, worked in these factories often forced to do so by either their parents or by parish authorities, uh, and they labored very long hours, uh, repetitive tasks, noisy, smelly, dangerous conditions for uh, pitifully small wages. Uh, the environmental impact of factories also received criticism. You know, once coal power supplanted uh, water power, you know, perhaps the most famous critique ever made of the factory is just a few words from William Blake when he talked about the dark satanic mills, right, uh, which he said were blotting England's mountains green and pleasant pastures. I think he wrote that in 1804. So this is 1835 picture of a 1721 factory. Whoops, one direction. Uh, that's 1835 of a brand new factory. It's in Manchester, England on Union Street. Bigger scale, but most dramatically, now with coal power, you could see the polluted air. And by the way, these canals were absolutely filthy with human waste, with dyes, with chemicals used in the process. Um, you know, there was nothing unique to the factory about exploiting people, including children. You know, for example, there were many, many more children in domestic labor in England uh, than there were in factories. You know, and they lived miserable lives and were greatly exploited. But the factory, uh, because of its prominence, it its sort of burst into existence as this new thing, became the focus of a lot of attention and also became a place where people thought that they could improve the conditions of workers, in part because it was centralized. So for example, the very first laws in England that regulated work only applied to cotton mills. So there's both a recognition of exploitation and a hope that this could be an arena of improvement. Um, so there's a lot of debate, a lot of debate. Some critics thought the factory was irredeemable, 
you know, just bad. You know, and then there were a lot of other people who had a more complex view. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, for example, the great British writer, uh, argued that the ills of the factory system were not intrinsic to it. This is what he wrote, I, it's just a great quote. He says, cotton spinning is the clothing of the naked in its result, the triumph of man over matter in its means. Soot and despair are not the essence of it, they are divisible from it, okay? And I think this faith that the sort of Promethean triumph of the factory fundamentally represents human progress and can be cleansed of its abuses became the sort of standard liberal belief from Thomas Carlyle all the way up to you know, Tim Cook, the current president of uh, Apple. Um, of course, others saw it somewhat differently. For Frederick Engels and Karl Marx, the large factory combined the most advanced uh, forms of exploitation with a potential for liberation. You know, they saw the factory as creating great suffering, but also a new social class, a proletariat that they believe would eventually take over society and improve conditions. You know, Engels, who spent most of his adult life working as a manager of a British you know, cotton mill, that's what he did for a living, uh, in Manchester, within blocks of that picture, which you're looking at right now, uh, wrote precisely that quality of large-scale industry, which in present society produces all misery, is the very quality under which a different social organization will destroy that same misery, okay? Will destroy that same misery. Well, about the time that Engels is writing that, or even a little before that, the factory leaps across the Atlantic to the United States. And when it does, at least for a while, it sheds its kind of negative connotations. When Charles Dickens in, in 1842 was touring the United States, one of the places he went was to Lowell, Massachusetts, which was the biggest cotton manufacturing place in the United States. And uh, he said that if he made a comparison between Lowell and the English cotton mills, it would be, uh, the contrast would be a strong one, he wrote, for it would be between good and evil, uh, the living light and the deepest shadow. So that's quite a stark uh, juxtaposition. Um, in England, you know, it's the creation of this new permanent proletariat, often of women and children, that is the source of so much criticism. In the United States, it's the lack of a permanent proletariat that makes the factory look like a different entity and, and, and a more positive uh, model. Um, uh, Lowell mill owners staffed their factories with young women who came from the countryside, not to be permanent workers, but to spend a kind of interlude of three, four, five years after leaving their family, before getting married, often before going back home, uh, to work as factory workers. And to attract these workers, uh, the mill owners had to make the factories and the factory towns seem like safe and attractive places. Um, uh, with their churches, their lectures, their literary societies. Uh, they had to assure the parents that their daughters would be safe in these places, morally safe. So they had to live in boarding houses. They, uh, to keep their jobs, had to go to church. They had to be sober. Uh, and, and so forth. Um, and the visual representations, representations of Lowell often present a kind of pastoral vista in which this new mode of production was incorporated. Whoops, now I'm going the wrong way. There you go. That's a picture of Lowell, Massachusetts. And again, the contrast is, is pretty uh, sharp. Um, and this was very important because, you know, at the time of the American Revolution, I mean, we all talk about Hamilton, right? You know, Hamilton was a great proponent of manufacturing, but, you know, he lost that debate. In fact, his great plans didn't happen. Uh, most American leaders were fearful that manufacturing would bring the ills of Europe to the United States. They wanted an agrarian society, which they thought was the key to maintaining a Republican society. So, you know, when Lowell comes along, it's portrayed as a kind of uh, continuation of that kind of pastoral society. And many critics by the 1830s and 40s of the factory system, looking at Lowell and places like that, came to believe that the United States could shape a industrial system that would be shorn of the evils 
that had accompanied it in Europe. Now, I have to say, not everyone agreed with this. Some very shrewd observers, like, for example, Alex de Tocqueville, who also went to Lowell, Massachusetts, everybody went to Lowell, Massachusetts, you know, he saw British-like class divisions beginning to emerge. And in fact, Lowell soon lost its role as a kind of uh, exemplar, or what one writer called the commercial utopia, because in fact, the working conditions did deteriorate, and many of the young New England girls who came to work there, uh, they didn't have to work there. They did not come from extreme poverty the way factory workers in England did, and they just leave. Um, luckily for the factory owners, it's just about the same time as the Irish famine. So all these impoverished, desperate Irish families that come to the United States, and they replace the native-born young female workforce in these mills. But by then, I think Lowell had done its job. It had promoted the idea that a f industry could coexist with Republican values uh, and that cheap standardized manufacturing uh, could be a road to, to progress. Progress becomes equated with technological ingenuity and, and material bounty. Um, so that's Lowell. Uh, in the mid-19th century, it gets displaced by the iron and steel industry, which eclipses cotton textile uh, as the symbol of modernity with the largest uh, factories. The biggest factories in the world in the 1870s are iron and steel complexes in Europe, the Krupp plant in Germany, the Le Crusoe, if you ever buy Le Crusoe pots, that factory has been going on forever. In the 1870s, it had 12,000 workers, much bigger than any uh, cotton mill uh, ever had. And you know, people became fascinated, uh, even more than with textile, with, with steel and iron production. The public became fascinated. There's a glamour about the making of steel, John Fitch wrote. Uh, in a study of Pittsburgh steel workers. The very size of things, the immensity of the tools, the scale of production grips the mind with an overwhelming sense of power, majestic and illimitable. Uh, heroic images of workers, you know, uh, using fire to turn ore into metal were very common in 19th century journals. Uh, they're also, uh, uh, steel mills were a favorite for postcards. This is a, uh, picture that comes from the archive of a postcard company. And it actually was one of four adjacent pictures to make a panorama. This is Homestead, Pennsylvania. This was the Andrew Carnegie owned steel mill that was the most advanced steel mill in America. And people are buying postcards of, of it. You know, it's, it's sort of funny. Uh, you know, these, these mills are hailed as sort of symbols of civilization, of the advance of civilization. Um, you know, uh, it soon became a kind of axiom, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, that national greatness required a steel industry, that steel industry was a precondition to modernity and full sovereignty. And by the way, this belief is still uh, shared by many people today. Just a few months ago, Donald Trump tweeted, quote, if you don't have steel, you don't have a country. Okay, if you don't have steel, you don't have a country. Um, so steel displaces textile at the forefront of large industry, and then the automobile industry comes along and displaces steel and pushes up the scale of, of, of factories even larger with the introduction of mass production techniques, including the assembly line. Um, in 1924, uh, the Ford Motor Company's Highland Park plant in Detroit had 42,000 workers, and it was soon supplanted by this company's uh, River Rouge complex, also right next to Detroit, which at its peak in 1929 had 102,000 workers. So in a way, I was a little wrong in the beginning when I said the plant size was unprecedented. I mean, in some ways, River Rouge did you know, provide a precedent. And these uh, automobile factories and other mass production assembly line type factories Again, fascinated journalists, political activists, artists, the general public. Part of the fascination is the promise that the extraordinary efficiency of these plants would so lower the cost of complex consumer goods, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, cars, that the general public could buy them. Um, you know, uh, Edward Filene, uh, who was one of the owners of the Filene's department store, but he's also a big reformer. He helped 
found the 20th Century Fund, and he was very interested in social problems. He wrote uh, that in Fordism lay, quote, a finer and fairer future than most of us have even dared to dream. So, you know, so some of the attraction was this kind of social promise, but also uh, many people are just entranced by the physical structures of this new mass production system. Uh, and, and more than in the past, uh, uh, artists uh, link the giant factory to sort of modernist trends in the arts. So uh, photographer Margaret Bork White, the famous uh, Life magazine photographer, uh, kind of captured the spirit of the age when she wrote, I worship factories, I worship factories. Um, Henry Ford promoted interest in his factories in order to sell cars. He designed his factories as advertising tools. This is, uh, this is the Ford River, uh, not uh, Highland Park plant in 1923. Um, you, oh wait, so I think someone told me, I got like a thing. Oops, now I pushed the wrong button. Ah, all wrong. Now I'm going the wrong way. Let me go back to there. Uh, yeah. See over there, the smokestacks, he puts his name there. The engineers who designed this factory said, you need three smokestacks. Ford said, no, build five, because I want my name between them. There's actually plate glass uh, windows on the front, there's the power plant. You can walk along the street and see this giant machinery. In other words, Ford comes to the idea that you can sell uh, cars and products by associating them with the factory. People want to buy the factory, you know. When they introduced the Model A, which is the first car that's made at his next great plant, the River Rouge plant, uh, the Ford Advertising Agency hires Charles Sheeler, you know, he's the great American painter, but he also, Sheeler made his living by doing commercial photography, and they hire Sheeler to take pictures of the factory, not the car, you know? And Sheeler uh, wrote in 1938, he said, I speak in the tongue of my times, of the mechanical, the industrial, our factories are our substitutes for religious expression, okay? Uh, if I'm going the right direction, this is the most famous of the photographs he takes of the River Rouge plant. Uh, it's called Criss Cross Conveyors Ford Plant, 1927, and though it looks like an art object, and it is an art object, it actually was taken for advertising campaign, which was run in American magazines. Um, like the earlier factory owners, Ford promotes not just his mechanical system, but his social system. Uh, the set of relationships that he puts in place in his factories with workers, which include both high wages, these were always high wage jobs, but extreme surveillance of the workers, not only on the job, but uh, off the job. He actually had uh, what today what we call sort of social workers who go visit workers in their homes to make sure they were living right. Um, Ford and his supporters promote the Ford system as the dawn of a kind of new society that uh, would create a new bounty but required a kind of new type of man, a new type of person to operate in this new mechanical uh, universe of mass production. And interestingly, many people on the political left, even more than conservatives, initially kind of embraced this vision. For example, the uh, left-wing American journalist John Reed or the Italian communist uh, leader Antonio Gramsci. Uh, visual artists who, who, who depict these factories tend to be celebratory. You know, if you look at pictures of factories, by interwar year uh, photographers and artists like Bork White and Sheeler and Elsie Driggs and Charles DeMuth, you know, they kind of focus on the form, the uh, shape, the surface, the symmetry of these factory buildings, uh, with workers absent or dwarfed by the setting. You, know, you notice there, there are just no people. Uh, in, remember, there are 102,000 people that work in this factory you know, at its height. There's not a single one in that, that, that photograph. Uh, rather than as sites of exploitation, factories appear as pinnacles of beauty on a kind of man-made landscape. Even probably the most famous of all the depictions of mass production, uh, which is, whoops, hit the wrong button. That, Diego Rivera's uh, Detroit Industry Mural in the Detroit Institute of Art, uh, which does obviously depict people, 
uh, ultimately is kind of celebratory of the power seized by nature and harnessed by the giant factory. This, by the way, is just a tiny detail of one of 27 frescoes. If you've never seen this thing, it's mind-blowing. It surrounds the courtyard of the Detroit Institute of Art. And if you're ever anywhere near Detroit, I, I recommend you, you go uh, see it. Ford becomes the new template for industry, and what's interesting is it's not just a template in the United States, and it's not just a template in capitalist society, but it becomes a global template. Uh, following the Russian Revolution, you know, in 1917, there's great debate in the new Soviet Union, which is trying to overcome its, its, its backwardness and poverty, about whether or not it should adopt these new capitalist methods like mass production factories, you know. Um, and there was a lot of debate about it. You know, a lot of the opponents in the Soviet Union said, well, look, you know, what was the point of the revolution? You know, these are factories designed to exploit people to make profit, right? But there were others that say, no, wait a second, you know, maybe we can harness this uh, technology, this approach to our own needs. And in fact, I think the most powerful defense of the Ford-style factory that was ever made was actually made by, of all people, Leon Trotsky, who was one of the you know, leaders of the Russian Revolution. Um, uh, Trotsky argued, quote, the fundamental, main, and most important task is to abolish poverty. It is necessary that human labor shall produce the maximum possible quantity of goods. A high productivity of labor cannot be achieved without mechanization and automation, the finished expression of which is the assembly line. So when that debate's dissolved, when the Soviets begin their first five-year plan in the late 1920s to industrialize the country, they uh, uh, center it on big factories and big infrastructure projects. And very much like people in the capitalist West, the Bolsheviks come to associate mechanization and mass production and giant factories with progress, with civilization, with what it means to be modern, with modernity. Um, of course, they, they don't have the technical capacity to build plants like this, so they turn to American and, and Western European architects and engineers to take the lead in building massive manufacturing plants, which in many cases are directly copied from American factories, uh, like the uh, Gorky automobile plant, which was designed uh, with the help of Ford and uh, was a smaller version of the River Rouge. Uh, this is the first Ford produced in the Soviet Union. You could see, actually, you could probably recognize it's, it's the Ford Model A. Uh, Ford sold the equipment that he used to make the Model A to the Soviet Union when he introduced a new model. Um, and, and these giant Soviet factories were, were conceived of as not just uh, economic institutions, but institutions of culturalization that would create sort of new men and new women, uh, you know, a cultural project that, 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 that the Bolsheviks saw as fighting the uh, longstanding backwardness of, of the areas that made up the Soviet Union, illiteracy, ignorance of technology, of modern medicine, uh, and so forth. And, you know, the simple act of uh, coming to a factory could begin the cultural transformation. There's an amazing book that was published in the 1930s in English. It's oral histories of the first workers in the Stalingrad tractor plant, which was also built with American help. And uh, one guy, he's like, he becomes a dye maker. He comes from you know, absolutely nowhere. He's totally impoverished. He literally has one change of underwear and a little basket. That's everything he owns. You know, he gets to this factory. He begins to make money. You know, what's the first thing he buys? a toothbrush, right? You know, what is it, you know, a better symbol of modernity than the toothbrush, right? You know, he buys a toothbrush, makes a little more money, buys a towel, he buys, you know, a suit, he buys a winter coat, uh, he begins to buy books, he buys a clock, always a symbol of industrial discipline and modernity, you know, pictures on his wall. Uh, uh, he's, he's, he's a different person. And uh, as in the United States, these giant factories in the Soviet Union are widely celebrated uh, you know, as a symbol of kind of uh, uh, man's triumph over nature and kind of seizing uh, the future, you know, seizing the future. And after World War II, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting, it continues that way in the Soviet Union, while in the United States, things go in a different direction. Uh, the giant factory begins to diverge in the United States uh, 
and in the expanded uh, communist bloc. In the United States, after World War II, major companies stopped building the kind of giant complexes they'd been building uh, since the 1880s, big centralized integrated factories. And in my view, the reason they do this primarily is their experience with labor strikes and labor militancy in the 1930s and the 1940s. Because what they discover is the brilliance of a centralized integrated operation leaves you vulnerable to a group of workers, for example, let's say in the only factory that makes every Chevrolet engine in the United States, and there was only one in the 1930s, to go on strike. And if they do that, you shut down a good part of all of General Motors. Uh, and the big strike wave after World War II uh, leads many companies to accelerate what they had begun in the 1930s, which is to disperse their facilities to smaller plants around the country often at the time introducing greater automation uh, as they build multiple plants to make every part and every product. So if workers disrupt one plant, they still have a kind of backup system. Um, the General Electric Schenectady Works, for example, had 40,000 people during World War II. By 1965, it has 8,500. In the Soviet bloc, it goes a different way. Um, giant factories continue to be promoted as a way to seize modernity. The Soviet Union uh, continues to rebuild and expand its giant factories. Uh, the uh, Magnitogorsk steel complex just past the Ural Mountains becomes the largest steelworks in the world. A um, uh, Soviet auto plant that was built in the 1970s has 112,000 workers. Uh, and many of these Soviet plants, by the way, even built in the 1960s, often have a whole new community is built around them to house the workers that have a, a kind of little bit of a whiff of remaining utopianism. They often have a lot of communal facilities, a lot of cultural facilities. Uh, they're still kind of thought of in the terms of the early revolution as you know, an example of what the new life will be. And they press the Soviets, Eastern European countries, to do the same thing, uh, to adopt this giant factory model. The most impressive of the Eastern European factories on this model is this, this is called the Lenin Steelworks. Uh, it's in uh, Krakow, or actually a kind of suburb of Krakow called Neue Hütte. It was built after World War II, and a whole new city was built up surrounding it. I love this photograph. So this photograph's taken in 1965. And you know, talk about seizing the future. I mean, on one hand, in 1965, in Poland, they are still plowing with Horses. They don't have tractors yet, right? And the other hand, in the background, you know, is this absolute up to the state of the art gigantic uh, factory. Um, of course, the irony is that Eastern European managers, leaders, eventually learn the same lesson as American corporate leaders, which is if you put all these workers together, uh, they're going to begin to exert control. And in fact, this factory was one of the major centers for the Solidarity Union uh, that arose in the 1980s in Poland. And it's actually a strike in this particular factory that forced the first free parliamentary elections in Poland after the communist takeover and actually begins the unraveling of Eastern European socialism. So, you know, this vision in Eastern Europe of a utopia built on the giant factory comes to an end right here, okay, right here. Um, but even larger factories were still to come. I'm gonna just do this quickly because I've taken a lot of time. But you know, as I said earlier, the largest factories ever to exist uh, operate today in China and Vietnam, making products like smartphones and tablets and, and, and uh, brand name sneakers. Uh, I think two things led to this last, latest wave of giant factories. Uh, one were changes in China and Vietnam, the opening up uh, in the, starting in the 1980s to foreign investment and to sort of capitalist uh, factories as an effort to try to increase their standards of living. And the other was this big change in Western Europe and the United States where brand companies sort of marketers take over from manufacturers in, 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 in shepherding products you know, to the consumer. Uh, companies that basically design products and sell them, but don't necessarily manufacture them, and actually uh, hire others to do that. And that's what these giant modern 
Asian factories do. They are contractors for companies like Nike and Samsung and Reebok. And, you know, by the way, if you go into one of these shoe factories, every single brand is made in the same factory. Right, you know, uh, uh, and, and Foxconn doesn't just make Apple stuff, it makes you know, Lenovo and Samsung and everybody else under the sun. Um, these giant factories, you know, are different in some ways from those in the past. For one thing, they, rather than being celebrated, they're often hidden. They're often hidden away. You know, 19th, 20th century factory owners, they were proud of their factories. It was advertising, like Ford, or it was an example of what socialism would bring you. But these modern companies, you know, their clients are not the general public. They're other companies, right? And those other companies, companies like Apple, have no interest whatsoever in you knowing anything whatsoever about the place in which their products are made. Um, uh, these factories also, unlike the showcase factories of the past, are not generally you know, sources of great national pride because they're foreign owned. They're generally managed by foreign managers and most of what they make is being sold elsewhere, right? So rather than being symbols of how advanced the host countries are, actually these factories are reminders of how much catching up they have to do, okay? Uh, the giant Asian factories of today are devoid of the kind of heroic overtones associated with the early large-scale industry. Now, part of this is a gender issue because, you know, electronic and shoe factories are heavily staffed by women. And the kind of heroic utopian imagery that, you know, we often associate with production is often of the, you know, the uh, brawny male, you know, you know figure, the... the, the like Prometheus himself, right, you know, uh, 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 and, and that's not how it works in these factories. Um, and in fact, rather than representing a kind of enlargement of the human spirit, I think modern factory giants often seem to symbolize its diminishment. You know, images of, of, of giant factory in China by, uh, you know, very well-known photographers like Andreas Gorky, Gorski or, or Edward Bratinsky, you know, they typically don't celebrate machinery or man's triumph over nature. Uh, instead, they, they, they document bland structures or portray repetitiveness, size as endless replication. So here is a photograph by Edward Bratinsky, a Canadian photographer uh, of a Chinese factory. Uh, it's in Fujian, uh, province. It makes uh, coffee pots and other small appliances. By the way, this is by Chinese standards, it's a small factory. It's got 20,000 workers. This is not even a huge factory. But, you know, look what he's photographing compared to Charles Scheeler, you know, in an earlier era. Um, so these modern factories represent a culmination of, of, of the history of industrial giantism. Uh, they, they, they entail all the lessons about assembling workers, coordinating production, division of labor, economies of scale, and so forth. Um, the past, in a sense, lives in the present, but I don't think the future lives in the present. You know, the factory no longer represents a vision of a different world coming, of a utopia or a dystopia. You know, the uh, modernity Foxconn style may be associated with higher living standards or neat gadgets, but not with a new phase of human history as the factory wants to be associated with both in England and the United States or for that matter in Poland and the Soviet Union. So let me, I'm already going long, but let me just spend a, two minutes making a few summary comments. The very big factory has been with us for three centuries, but no individual factory has lasted anywhere near that long. So the Darby silk mill I started with it continued to produce silk for 169 years, which is actually exceptionally long for any factory. But it's not exceptionally long for human institutions. You know, lots of human institutions continue to function in their same buildings for, for many years. You know, parliaments, we have jails that are longer than 169 years. You know, uh, we have opera companies that have been going for longer than 169 years. Factories look so permanent, you know, they look so solid, but in fact they're not. They very rarely last more than a generation or two. There's a kind of uh, natural life history. They start with a big bang. You know, they change the society. They have kind of super profits, often from exploiting workers who had not previously been in the labor market. Kids, 
prisoners, peasants, wards of the state, small farmers, you name it, nomads, you know. Um, but eventually, you know, uh, reformers and workers push up labor prices, and these big factories tend to be conservative. They got so much money invested in plant and equipment that they tend to not want to change the way they do things. A newcomer comes along, and pretty soon, the old one is no longer profitable. Um, so what has kept this industrial giantism going is not the durability of any given factory, uh, which is not sustainable over the long run, but uh, its replication, reemergence as a system in new places with new workforces, natural resources, conditions of backwardness to be exploited. Um, and meanwhile, of course, the shuttered factories leave behind uh, environmental and kind of social wreckage. Today we're seeing this story playing out, you know, once again. You know, Americans complain about China taking away jobs, but actually, you know, factory jobs in the places like South China, which are associated with the factories I've been talking about, are beginning to leave because land costs and labor costs have become too expensive. So they're moving either to cheaper parts of China, central China, or to other places like Cambodia or Bangladesh or Ethiopia. This is a Chinese-owned shoe factory in Ethiopia. You know, um, that's modernity for you, you know? Um, so, you know, this is a dynamic system. In my view, the age of the mass factory is not over, even though automation is growing. Um, there's no sign, in my view, that the mass production factory is going to disappear. People have been saying this for 60 years. Automation is going to take it over. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. Of course, there'll be changes, but I think this is something that we still live with. So, you know, uh, let me just conclude by saying that, you know, as a system, this is marching on in any given place, like the United States or England or maybe at some point in China, um, uh, it, it, it leaves things behind. And I think where the factory uh, has... Uh, gone, uh, we tend to see social malaise and kind of shriveled imagination. You know, for many places that were once factory centers, um, you know, the future's already come and gone. And I think people, may, they may have sneakers, they may have a cell phone, but they have very little hope about the future and their ability to master it. Um, so as I write in the conclusion of the book, you know, it seems to me that the giant factory uh, uh, demonstrated in practical, concrete ways, the ability of mankind to exert mastery over nature, you know, to improve the standard of living for billions of people, of course, and doing a lot of damage and exploitation at the same time. Um, but, you know, uh, if the factory, you know, demonstrated that the, the link between exploitation and material advance, between freedom and coercion, I think maybe its most important lesson for us today living in the United States uh, is one that's very easy f to forget, which is simply that it's possible to reinvent the world. You know, it's been done before, it can be done again. Thank you. Before we get to the Q&A session, please acknowledge that this is going to be recorded and wait for the microphone to come to you. Thank you. Thank you for a very fine presentation. Just out of curiosity, looking at this picture, uh, it's, it's in Ethiopia. Is, is it air conditioned? Uh, that's number one. Is it, uh, they all seem to be wearing the same uh, yeah, uniform. Yeah, no, it's not. Can you talk it's, about it? Yeah. Uh, I, no, it's not air conditioned. In fact, I think you can see it's an open sided shed. And in fact, many, many Chinese companies in China, as well as uh, in other parts of the world, uh, workers wear uniforms. Foxconn workers wear uniforms. It's very, very common. Um, uh, and above, beyond that, I don't know a whole lot about this particular factory, but one little factoid that I ran into, which was, I, you know, I couldn't make this up, was just uh, after, actually it was in October of 2016, just before the election, the Chinese company that makes the shoes for Ivanka Trump's shoe line moved its production to Addis Ababa. And what you don't need air conditioning, but what you do need is a steady supply of electricity, and you need access to a container port. 
uh, you know, good and there's a rail line that links Addis Ababa to a container port. And that seems to be the basic, and you need like a, I wouldn't say authoritarian, but you need a government that controls things. So sort of workers and labor markets don't spin out of control. And Ethiopia apparently is now seen by many Chinese companies as having those prerequisites, so it's, it's a kind of favored investment site. Two quick questions. Uh, first of all, you completely left out the unique concept that developed in Korea of the chai bowl, uh, which is a matter of national pride and effectively was created from whole cloth because they were an agrarian society that became mm -hmm. one of the richest and most industrialized countries in the world. Uh, I'm wondering what the changes are that you see from that. <clears throat> the other question is about the concept of mass customization, which is now beginning to be developed. 3D printing is a perfect example of it. Right now, economically, you don't mass produce things with 3D printing, but we don't know exactly where it's going. You see major 3PL companies such as UPS, which are outfitting entire warehouses, complexes with 3, uh, 3PL, I'm sorry, with the 3D printing machines to be able to have their customers avoid having to ship the parts all over the country, but instead make it to their specs in a given place to get it faster to their own factories. Yeah, let me, let me, let me try to address those two. And the first one I've got very little to say about. You know, I, I had to be selective. So I, I use almost arbitrarily what are the biggest employing factories at any given historical moment. And you know, some of those Korean factories that you're talking about are very big, like Hyundai, for example, I think has 40,000 workers in its main plant. But actually, it's completely dwarfed in terms of the number of workers by Foxconn. So I couldn't do everything. I talk a little bit about Egypt. I talk a little about Germany in the book. Uh, there are many alternative variants that arise out of different national situations. And your point's well taken. And you know, uh, this is not meant to be a full topography. In terms of 3D printing and the future manufacturing, in my view, there are going to be multiple futures. You know, I, I certainly think that, that what exactly what you're talking about, 3D printing is great for replacement parts, for niche goods, for low-run production. I think we'll see more and more of it, and it can happen in very creative ways. It can happen with innovators in places like the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Army Terminal, as well as giant companies like UPS. Uh, we also see you know, much more heavily you know, automated factories, particularly in the United States and other high wage areas. And I think to the extent that there's a future of factory production in the United States, it will be that. But I don't see in the near future the disappearance of the gigantic factory putting together things like sneakers and, and uh, uh, electronics. It's interesting, like Foxconn, Foxconn got kind of scared off after all these workers started jumping off their roofs. So the first thing they, they did, which was the most Orwellian thing, and I, I don't have a picture with me, but there are pictures of this, is they put um, netting around all their factory buildings. You know, they also have a huge number of dormitories. 70,000 workers live in Foxconn dormitories in Foxconn City. So they put netting around all these buildings. So if you jumped off the roof, you wouldn't hit the ground. That was their first response. Um, they also decided to experiment with automation, and they did automate one of their uh, phone plants, which reduced its size from 100,000 to 50,000. So it didn't become small, but, you know, but that doesn't seem to be the direction they're going, actually. You know? And when they built a new plant in Chengdu to make iPhones, it has over 300,000 workers. So I think you're going to see multiple types of manufacturing meeting different market needs you know, in, in different economic circumstances going forward. Thank you very much, Professor. So I have a question. So you, you measured so much by labor force and labor size. But in truth, if you look at factories, especially in Western Europe and the United States today, <coughs> the value of the productivity of goods coming out is so far skewed from the previous relationship of employees to value, but you don't, but you don't seem to be addressing that. In other words, you don't seem to be addressing the fact that we're getting the same amount of product from far fewer employees, and maybe that's a different challenge for society. Well, you know, your point's well taken, and you know, I guess because I'm a labor historian, you know, I was trying to think, well, what's, how do I measure 
factory size. You know, so my first instinct, I guess I'm interested in the human experience of, of, of the person involved in making things. So I looked at number of employees. But you know, value added is another way. You could look at physical size. I mean, using that measure, the largest factory in the world is the Boeing plant in Renton, Washington. You know, but I think it has maybe 20,000 workers, something like that. Um, clearly, automation increases productivity. And that's been true from the 1721 you know, silk mill uh, all the way forward. I don't think there's anything conceptually different today in the fact that introducing new systems of organization, new technologies, uh, increases productivity. You know, that's the story of the last 300 years, and we're seeing that continue to happen. And of course, it does have huge social implications. I mean, if the factory system globally continues to be a huge employer, that may not be true in the Illinois town where, you know, the rubber, the tire plant closed and the, this plant closed and the, with, with leaving, you know, tremendous social problems behind. I mean, look at Flint, Michigan, you know, the center of the GM uh, empire in the 1930s and 40s. Today, it's so uh, messed up and held in such contempt that, you know, government officials decided they'd rather poison the population than paying a little bit extra to, to you know, treat the water that they were giving them. You know, it, it, so, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. There, there are tremendous social implications because the human ingenuity and investment that goes behind these kinds of advances doesn't result in a broad improvement in everyone's lives, you know? And that's become more true in recent years than it used to be true. So these are great political challenges, essentially, you know, and we're not alone in facing them. And some countries, I think, have done better and some not as good in, in, in these transitions. Hi, that was very informative here um, on your lecture. I was curious why you um, you didn't talk about Japan in there in, in comparison. I know, yeah. you, you, like, again, yeah. you only had so many things to look at, but is Japan uh, continuing to modernize their factories, or are they also looking like China to, to bring that to lower-cost countries? Well, both. You know, both. So one of the lower-cost countries that they bring their manufacturing to is the United States. So, you know, Japanese companies, you know, build, I, I have a Subaru, it was built in Southern Illinois. You know, that's a low wage region, you know. Um, and uh, these days, you know, in a non-union plant, and of course, it, it, it deals with any tariff problems. But Japan continues to very much have an industrial policy, a national governmental policy of maintaining and renewing uh, manufacturing. And you know, I don't deal with Japan, but it is a fascinating story because, you know, uh, a lot of the post-World War II technical approaches to manufacturing in Japan were adopted by the United States and then kind of perfected. And by the 1970s, you know, in 1980s, when many American manufacturing companies were producing inferior products at higher costs, they then looked back to Japan and kind of re-import, you know, techniques which had been exported to Japan uh, during the American occupation. Uh, refined in Japan and brought back to the United States. So, you know, the idea of, of, of sort of teams and the idea that workers can, for example, uh, stop the assembly line if they see a quality control program. Some of these things which are now standard in a lot of American companies were actually, you know, brought in the 1980s and 1990s back to the United States from Japan. Last question. This one back. Uh, Professor Freeman, I think it was wonderful. Great, great energy you have. But I have a question about uh, Western Electric, because both my parents work for them, yeah. and they're all passed away. Can you talk a little bit about what happened to Western Electric, which was a, par a large part of our country back in, what, the 40s and the 50s and what have you, uh, and the demise of Western Electric? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, only in the general sense. They work in, sh in, in the Cicero plant, or they work around here? In, in the New York area. Yeah. Well, you know, Western Electric was the, basically the captive manufacturing arm of the Bell Telephone system when Bell Telephone was uh, a monopoly. And, and almost all telephone service in the United States, not all of it, but yeah, I don't know, 80% or something like that was the Bell system. And they had 
their own manufacturing enterprise. And it was all like, you know, it was very much like kind of Ford. The model was total integration. You know, Ford literally made his own steel, he made his own glass, he made his own rubber, he owned his own forests, he owned his own rubber plantation. And the Bell system was a bit like that. They had, you know, Bell Labs to innovate technologically, they had their own long line systems and their own manufacturing systems. And uh, it, you know, for, for people interested in the history of management, Western Electric was really an uh, uh, interesting company because a lot of the uh, key experiments in the 1920s about how to increase productivity among workers were done at uh, Western Electric plants. So, but you know, uh, I don't know the clear history of it, but once the Bell system was partially as a result of government action and for economic reasons kind of disintegrated, which is now the model of most companies, you know, they, they, not to vertically integrate, but to disintegrate, right? Um, it no longer was able to succeed, you know, as a uh, telecommunications equipment maker uh, on the scale today. If it did, it would be making the iPhone instead of it being made in Foxconn, but it's being made in Foxconn, not in Western Electric. Thank you. Check, 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 check. Oh, would you mind remaining up with us for a minute? Sure. Oh, yes. Give me. Thank you. Uh, uh, Josh, I just want to say thank you so much. That was such a fascinating, thought provoking, and eloquent presentation. It really was. It really was terrific. And I think we'll all. Uh, mull over what you said, like for instance, I can understand myself, I'm thinking, oh, factories, it's, it's a dying industry, but you have made me see that factories are going to be part of our future and, and your wonderful explanation of modern, modernity will continue to be part of our life in the foreseeable future. So thank you so much. We're really delighted that you could be here tonight and we would now like to make a presentation. And to do so is Victoria Dangler, Executive Director. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Joshua, thank you so much. That, that was absolutely fascinating. And some of um, our audience here might know the story of our member, Andrew Carnegie, who was a member here in 1903. And since 1785, we have every signature of every member. And you put your name and your trade going back to our first member and those 21 other artisans who assembled on November 17, 1785, but our first president was Robert Boyd, and he wrote Blacksmith next to his name. But along came Andrew Carty in 1903, who also paid for this um, extension to be built, this library to be built, and put two floors onto the building. But when he signed our register, although he was an industrialist at the time, he wrote Andrew Carnegie Cotton Spinner because he wanted to be known by his first job and out of his regard for uh, being a laborer. So just to share that with you. <laughs> and so the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, expresses its gratitude to Joshua B. Freeman, distinguished professor of history, Queens College and the Graduate Center, City University of New York, for a behemoth, a history of the factory, and the making of the modern world for his participation in the General Society Labor Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Oh. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm very touched. Oh, thank you. Hold on. That is a great tradition you have. And I'm honored to be part thank of it. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. And because you should get working on your next book, we've made you a lifetime member of the library. So oh, if you, in case you <laughs> any research. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so, in conclusion, um, I would, we would just make a, a, another small presentation, a poster as a reminder of tonight's talk, Thank you. It's a beautiful and our tote bag of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. Yes, I do, and I don't. I, for, I forgot to ask Josh if he'd seen the window when you arrived, but you'll have to have a look because it's been it's a very inventive window, as you will see. Um, I want to remind you that this splendid book is now for sale and will be signed uh, by Joshua. I want to thank you uh, for coming this evening.
for uh, many of you who've been to many of our 24 lectures, and I want to thank you for your support, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall. Please join us now with a glass of wine. Thank you so much.